congratulations, man. This is an amazing piece of work. And on all accounts, the entire cast, you, Lynn, you just kill it. Tick, tick, boom is the film. Let's talk about this because you didn't have a musical theater background. You you didn't consider yourself a singer before this. So I guess my question is, is it supreme confidence, supreme madness, supreme what to say yes to starring in this beloved musical opposite amazing musical performers? I don't know. It's a longing to feel alive, really, for me. It's like a longing to push myself to the edges of myself and see see if I survive it. And I don't know why I'm addicted to that. It is like an extreme sport acting thing, you know? So, so, so I'm always looking for that next kind of adventure and exploration to see if I survive, to see if I make it out alive, uh, so to speak, metaphorically speaking. I don't think anyone's died from not acting well. Uh, I don't think that's the thing. Lynn had the belief, really. Lynn had seen me in Angels yeah. in America, and he um, he thought, well, if he can do that, he can probably sing. And I think, you know, he, he he knew I was right for the role, but again, the question was, can he get there vocally? And then, you know, all he did was he really provided me with the time, the space, and, you know, I had a year, year and a half, and the resources to peel back the onion and let my voice kind of flow. And that was an amazing singing teacher called Liz Kaplan for the most part. And then outside of that, you know, his whole musical, um, direction group, you know, Alex Lackamore, his, his, you know, his, the other side of Lynn's brain, basically. And, you know, Kirk Crowley, who does all of like, you know, he's the musical director for Hamilton and like opens the shows everywhere. So I had, I had this amazing support system and it was a real took a village kind of thing. It was a, it was a, it was a tribal thing. And I was only able to get there with that kind of time, space and, and resource. Cause I think anyone can develop a skill if they're given love, anyone can grow a flower. You know, if, if the, if you give the flower attention, water and love and you, you sing to them, you know what I mean? So I think that's what they were all yeah. doing to me. And you know, and the same thing with the, with the musical performers around me with the Alex and Robin De Jesus and Vanessa and, and and Josh and MJ and Ben Ben Ross like they were all singing to me they were trying to help grow me as well and 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 they were doing it with such love it was the most incredible community experience that I'd ever had you talk about love I mean this is a film about love about loss I mean it's a lot of conflicting emotions in this film and I know you were going through a lot of conflicting emotions personally prior to this you suffered a, a great loss prior to this film yeah. I'm wondering when you see your performance in this, I mean, do you see the pain that you were going through underneath? Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's all in there. And I'm I'm so happy that it is because it, it's a it's a tribute. All the grief that we experience that I, I'll speak for myself, but my experience of grief is all the unexpressed love. You know, all the unexpressed love that you had for the person, whether it's the, the end of a relationship or the end of someone's life or or otherwise, it's there's a beauty to that pain. There's a beauty to that um, ex fully feeling and expressing that grief because it's an honoring of that. It's an honoring of the the, the absence, that the, the the huge hole and impression that that person has left in in your life and in your your sense of the world and in your sense of joy and meaning in the world. So for me to be able to honor my mother in every frame of this film, through my grief, through my sorrow, through my joy, through my longing to complete and sing some more notes of her song while she can't be here to do it herself, while also being able to sing, you know, notes of Jonathan Larson's song that was finished and half finished and and not completed because he passed away at a young age too. And, 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 the, and the film is so much thematically about the shortness of time that we have here. And Jonathan felt it and knew it so acutely, not just from seeing all of his friends and his theater community, so many of them who are getting sick and dying from AIDS in their early 20s in some cases, but also internally, he knew he had this sense of his own shortness of life. And it was it was prophetic as he died at the age of 35 uh, of a, a, an aortic aneurysm and, and um, it, his heart exploded. On the, on the eve of the first preview of, of Rent off Broadway, he didn't get to experience any of um, the success or the harvest of the, the hard work that he put in and the, 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 the devotion to his art that he put in. And, you know, he was faced with rejection all of his life. He never got to experience people going, yes, you, you did it, thank you. So now, you know, through this film, we're, we're, we're trying to give him his his flowers in the spirit realm, you know, and, and yeah. because this is really all him. He guided the ship on this through Lynn, used me as the channel and uh, and he kind of, um, he was running the show in unseen ways that were quite mystical and remarkable. The film talks about how many of our 
our professional or personal decisions are motivated by sometimes by fear or love or some combination of both. I feel like we've all been there. We've made different decisions in our lives based on either of those or both of those things. When you look at your own career, do you see yourself making more decisions based on one or the other? Have you ever made a career decision based on fear? Very rarely. I'm happy to say it's mostly love. I, I can really sincerely say that. There's maybe a couple of moments that were based on a little bit of fear and, and, and they didn't go well. Um, I'm not going to say what they are, but they didn't go well for me personally. They may, they may have been great films or great plays, but I, I didn't have a great time. It didn't feel in line with who I was. And I think it's very, very clear when you can feel whether you're on your own pathless path or yeah. not. It's quite an acute feeling, especially when you're mostly living out of that place of love. Yeah. Stephen Sondheim kind of looms large in this for, for John Larson as this almost like deity in his life and, mm. and for, for any musical theater lover he is. And his validation means so much to him. It kind of like gives him what he needs at that time. I'm curious, like, was there a person like that for you early on? Was there a phone call, someone you met that kind of like gave you the juice, the, that the motivation that you needed to kind of keep going early in your career? Oh yeah, definitely. And I think it's a vital aspect, a vital part of becoming who we are for any of us, that we have moments of mentorship. That is absolutely embedded in the psyche. We need someone outside of our family system usually who can see us clearer, who doesn't have expectation of us, who doesn't need us to be anything for their own benefit, like, you know, treating you like a, an appendage or like a, an extra limb that you know, somehow represents them. You need someone at least at one point to see you deeply and clearly, objectively. It could be a stranger on the street. It could be, you know, a teacher. It could be whatever. It's just, just, just to say, hey, I see you. I think maybe you should go this way because there's something there for you. And I, I, I was, I, and I've been personally very, very lucky to have that a few times. My mother set me on a path. Actually, she, 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 she was one of the first people that suggested to look at something creative. And it was coming out of a very lost period of my life when I was in, in my teenage years, and I was skateboarding, but then I broke my wrist, and I, I didn't, wasn't interested in academia. I stopped being an athlete, and my mother kind of told me to, to look at creativity, and I started doing plays, and it felt fun. I really loved it, but I didn't think anything more of it. But then this teacher showed up at my high school and it was a new drama teacher. And he just so happened to show up when I was about to decide what I was gonna specialize in, in my last two years of high school. And I was doing a school play. I just happened to be doing a school play. And he just happened to be seeing. And he, he, he came up to me afterwards and he said, hi, I'm, I'm Phil Tong. I'm, I'm the new drama teacher here at school. And I, I'm, I'm looking for people to sign up for the A-level course next year. And I really believe you should do it, do it with me because you're very talented and you have something to offer here. And I was like a dog with a bone. It was like water in the desert. I was like, tell me who I am. I need to know where I'm going. <laughs> And I followed him and I, and I did it. And that was the beginning. And then from then I've had multiple moments that have given me encouragement and kept me on the straight and narrow. Maybe, maybe the most profound person that became a mentor was Mike Nichols. Yeah. I'm so happy that I get to say that, that I get to say that he was someone that kind of offered me his guidance and wisdom as he did for so many people in his later years. It was a great privilege to, to have that with him. You know, a lot of this film is built around this workshop that Jonathan Larson is, is working towards. Mm. And he's pinning all of his hopes and dreams on what's gonna happen here. Again, just relating to your own career, I'm curious, was there like an audition that at the time felt like, this is it? I, I go left or right on, in the road based on this audition. Yeah, there actually was, but it was an audition for a film that never got made. Um, but it's something that's, that set the course for the rest of my career. It's so funny how, how it works. I was doing a play in London, um, three plays actually, four plays at the National Theatre in rep with each other. And Stephen Daldry's assistant had come to see the plays. And she had said to Stephen Daldry, hey, there's a young man and you should go and watch his work. And Stephen was, was working on casting a film at that time. So Stephen comes to see, see the play and he, and he asks to see me afterwards and we go for a walk on the South Bank. And he says, so I'm, I'm putting together a screen test for a film adaptation of a Michael Chabon book, The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay. Right, still hasn't been made. They've been trying I, for yeah. decades, yeah, yeah. And I was and I was like, I love Michael Chabon. I haven't read this book and I, and I immediately picked it up. He was like, I would love you to come and screen test. It was my first time on camera and it was um, a two day screen test. And then it was like a bunch of young men that were reading together for the two cousins. And suddenly I'm on set with Killian Murphy and Ryan Gosling and Jason <laughs> Schwartzman and Ben Whishaw and oh Jamie Bell. Yeah. And I'm a theater kid and I'm with all these people that I look up to so much 
And, um, you know, all these different pairings, we worked with each other. I remember like everyone was just incredible. But there's something about Ryan Gosling that just got me, like the way he worked and his spontaneity and his presence. And he was alive, it was an animal, he was amazing. And anyway, A.V. Kaufman was the, was the casting director of this, um, of this, this film. And uh, she ended up um, casting me in my first movie. This one never got made, but then I went and did um, the Robert Redford movie, Lions for Lambs, that she was, right. uh, she brought me in, she was really pushing me for. So without her eyes, and you know, then then you know everything leads to the next, and that that was uh, that was the moment that, and I, I could feel it. I could feel going into. It. I was like, this could be a step towards what I want my life to be, actually. And right. I, I maybe hadn't dared to dream consciously that I would ever make movies, to be honest. You know, I was I was I felt lucky enough that I was doing incredible plays in London and in Manchester and you know around around the UK. I thought this is this is a wonderful life. But then once you you open the door and you go, oh my God, this would this is this is a spectacular room. And I, I wonder if I could ever have the opportunity to do this. And then you know here we are, and I I, I can't quite believe how my life has unfolded. To be honest. Amazing, amazing story. Um, I'm gonna preface this the same way I prefaced the last time I brought up Spider-Man. I'm not asking you if you're in the new Spider-Man film, Andrew. <laughs> I'm not. For the record, the last time we talked, if you go back to the tape, I didn't even ask you if you were in Spider-Man. I don't know how to bring up the Spider-Man stuff because obviously I don't even want to like ruin anything if there is something to ruin, except to there say- There isn't anything to ruin, bro. I had to just quickly just cut you off. I feel like I'm in a game of <laughs> werewolf or mafia where I'm like, I'm not the werewolf. I promise you I am not the werewolf. And everyone's like, you're the werewolf. You're the werewolf. Look at him. Did I seem defensive? I'm just saying, <laughs> I, I'm not saying anything. I'm not saying anything. Good, me neither. <laughs> yeah. Were you amused though by the reaction yes. to, to your enthusiastic denial of said proceedings? I think it's hilarious, and I think it's I think it's great that you know this character means so much to so many people. It means so much to me as well. Like to be a part of the of the culture in that way. You know, I'm as excited as everyone to see what they yeah. do in this third film. Like it's a weird thing, man. Like I, I I found it so charming and fun, and like yeah, like I I would be guessing too. That's the terrible thing. It's like oh my god, of course. Like I would be like oh my god, I want I want to, you know, like a dog with a bone. But for me, like I look back on my tenure. And I'm just so happy. It's weird. Like the the more distance I get, the more joyful I am and and pure and how I look back. And I'm just like, oh my god, I got to play my childhood hero, and I and I got to do it with Emma, and I got to do it with Sally Field and Martin Sheen and Amy Pascal, and you know, it was I was just so so proud of it. And now with with what Tom has done and with what John Watts and, and Amy and and Kevin Feige have done, they've led it with soul. They've like it's been inje yep. it's just so injected with so much soul and humor and heart and goodness, like that essence of Spider-Man, the goodness. And Tom, it just pours out of every every pore in his in his being. And and I'm genu genuinely excited to see how they round off their, their trilogy like, and see what they do. I don't know if it's the lighting there or something, but you kind of look like a werewolf to me today. I'm just gonna- Oh really? Just gonna, a werewolf? Yeah, it's weird. Yeah, yeah. Like, like hairier than usual? Like what's the- Well, no, I don't know. You, you we, we Last time you referenced werewolves and feeling like a werewolf in a game and just today you look like a werewolf i look like a werewolf i feel like you're being a bit provocative josh and i'm not <laughs> i'm not crazy about it i'm gonna tell you that sorry okay let's go back to square one <laughs> Here, here's a provocative question for you greater piece of pop art rupaul's drag race or hamilton oh no don't no i refuse i refuse to answer <laughs> nope not gonna do it not gonna do it not gonna I do it was josh. provocative i told you that is more provocative than accusing me of being a werewolf <laughs> <laughs> they, they both By the way, I'm not the places. werewolf. I just want to set the record straight. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not the werewolf in the village. Okay. No, you could. Just go, okay, you were like. <laughs> you look like a werewolf. And you're like, okay, like all innocent. You know what you're doing, Josh. I do know what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, are you keeping up with Drag Race? Who are you rooting for? What's going on? I'm. I'm. I've only just started the most recent All Stars season, so don't tell me. I'm. Catch, I'm playing catch up because I'm in shooting in Calgary, so I haven't had a lot of time to to watch. And UK Drag Race season three, I hear, is incredible. I haven't started that yet, but it's. Um, yeah, I'm on. I'm on it. I'm trying to. I'm trying to play catch up. So I. I can't really talk about it now. I don't want you to spoil anything. <laughs> Totally. Let's go full circle. We started this by talking about sort of like how you're drawn to these roles that just are insane challenges. Is there another type of role or mountain that you're itching to climb? Like something that you haven't gotten to explore that would 
you know, necessitate the kind of time and effort that something like this did. I'm sure, I'm sure there is. I don't know what it is right now. It's a weird thing, man. Like I'm in a weird place where I feel so grateful, like overwhelmingly grateful for the for the stuff I've been allowed to do in, with, with my creative life. You know, there's a direct line from Angels in America to Tick, Tick, Boom for me in terms of um, th 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 they're, they're married somehow. There's a, there's a real relationship there between Pryor Walter and Jonathan Larson. Mm. You know, it's the same era, it's the same context, the same struggles and the same longing to live fully and to enable others to do the same. Uh, and to be an advocate for for life and for the sanctity of life. So I'm just full of gratitude at this at this moment, and it's hard for me to 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 know what the next dream is. Um, I, I'm I'm excited for it to reveal itself.